<laughs> okay, uh, thanks, Ken. Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to uh, the first in a two-part series about the importance of the census. We are honored to have our state historian tonight. I'll, I'll, I'll pause there because we'll let, allow Dr. Um, I'm super excited about uh, what we're about to hear tonight. Um, and, and let me just shameless pitch. Um, this is part of a, uh, an ongoing community dialogue that we've had uh, as a college for, for a few months now about the importance of the census and what it will do in terms of support for first responders, education, tribal communities, um, uh, uh, hospitals and uh, medical care and so much more. Um, and, uh, but there are a lot of things that we probably, we don't, aren't aware of, but that the census is really important for. Uh, we're racing against the clock because we have until the end of September, so every day matters. Um, and that's why we're, we're very grateful to have this conversation. I do wanna say a special thank you to Dr. Trujillo. Um, she has um, uh, been a, a huge advocate for this, uh, for this mission and, um, and our college's strongest voice on this issue. And so um, with that, it's my honor to introduce her, Dr. Trujillo. Thank you so much, Rick. Um, I'd really like to welcome everybody to Northern New Mexico College's Hispanic Heritage Month kickoff and one of our Census 2020 events. Um, as Dr. Bailey said, my name is Dr. Patricia Trujillo and I am the Director of the Office of Equity and Diversity and I will be your moderator for this evening. And if you're wondering why the heck we're connecting the Census and Hispanic Heritage Month, it is really interesting that we're connecting these endeavors because the term Hispanic has been the source of several debates in the United States about who uses it, who does it, if we should even use it. Um, there's often a critique that, uh, from, that stems from the Eurocentric perspective it imposes on a large and diverse community, a, a constituency of peoples. In the United States, the term originally referred to, uh, the term Hispanic um, originally referred to the Hispanos of New Mexico until the U.S. government used it in the 1970 census to refer to, quote, a person of Mexican, Puerto Rican, Cuban, South or Central American, or Spanish culture or origin, regardless of race, end quote. So that's a really big umbrella group of people. And also during that time, as the term Hispanic started to become popularized, the Office of Management and Budget didn't accept the recommendation to retain the single term Hispanic. Instead, the OMB decided that the term should be Hispanic or Latino because regional usage of the terms differed. So Hispanic is commonly, commonly used in the eastern portion of the United States, whereas Latino was commonly used in the western portion of the United States. And so since the 2000 census, the 2000 census, pardon me, the identifier has changed from Hispanic to Hispanic slash, um, to Spanish slash Hispanic slash Latino. And of the as of the 2020 census, there's even more specificity for Hispanic, Latino, or Spanish origin people. So now we get to choose uh, or check a box, right? Mexican, Mexican American, Chicano, are we Puerto Rican, Cuban, Hispanic, Latino, or Spanish origin um, originating from a nation state such as Salvadoran, Dominican, Colombian, Guatemalan, Spaniard, Ecuadorian, etc. So these additions acknowledge the distinction between Hispanic and Latino people who are U.S. ethnic born minor minorities and those who are born in their nation of origin and immigrate to the United States under a variety of circumstances. So a way to think of this is in the framework articulated by cultural geographer Daniel, Daniel Ariola, who defines Latino space and therefore identity as continuous, discontinuous, and emerging. But that is to say, to be the United States for over 400 years. So even as we celebrate the specificity added to the census through the years, scholars and community activists keep fighting for nomenclature in the census, and in general, where Hispanics and Latinos can identify in racially accurate ways that also include our indigeneity, our Afro-Latinidades, and in ways that demonstrate our commitment to being inclusive of the LGBTQIA communities so if you've been hearing Latinx or Chicanx, though it may still not roll off your tongue, 
Uh, this challenge to the inherent and gendered binary of the Spanish language insists on a gender neutral variant that is inclusive of our non-binary relatives. Because even if we don't know what to call it ourselves, uh, todos somos familia. So it is not an easy question, nor should it be, um, because as we celebrate the complexity of our Latino, Nuevo Mexicanidad, it is a deep and cherished responsibility to keep our history and culture alive. That is why it is a, an auspicious day that we gather, the 16 de septiembre, or Mexican Independence Day, to talk about the importance of our historic legacies and about how we continue to fight for our rights to citizenship in this country, in all our Latin American countries, and throughout the world. So that is why we're so glad and so honored today to be hosting uh, our esteemed New Mexico State historian who will be speaking to us about making sense of the census for genealogy. Uh, and uh, Rob Martinez is a native New Mexican. He was born and raised in Albuquerque, a graduate of the University of New Mexico with a BBA in International Business, Business Management. Rob went on to pursue his interest in New Mexican culture and history at UNM earning an MA in Latin American on church, cultural and social practices of the Spanish colonial period in New Mexico. Thank you so much for joining us today, Mr. Martinez, and welcome. Well, thank you very much. Muchisimas gracias. Que gran honor estar aquí con ustedes. Thank you very much for having me. I'm Robert Martinez, state historian, and I'm gonna just get into my presentation. So let's uh, get my PowerPoint up here. Uh, there it is, okay, share, amazing technology. And now let's see if I can get this going. There we go. Making sense of the census for genealogy. Um, Initially, when I was going to do this, I thought, well, I could give a nice, straightforward history talk about census records, look at some examples in that direction. And then I thought, I want to make it personal. I've done a lot of genealogy for other people, but today I want to show um, all of you out there watching how census records are excellent uh, documents for looking into our past, our, our uh, national past, our cultural past, and our family past. So uh, let's get started. Why are there census? Why a census? Well, usually we have the census to take the pulse and temperature of a nation or empire. Uh, census are taken to show the distribution of people throughout a region, the demographics. And they're also used to decide what kind of a tax base uh, the empire or nation will have and um, how much money maybe needs to go to the military because of where there are people and where the territories are extended to. You need to participate in a census because it helps the well being of the nation. Um, it helps you to participate in the history of the nation and also to participate in the history of you. So again, why a census? The Romans did it, the Spanish did it, the Mexicans did it, the USA did it and is doing it this year. Um, the Romans actually were one of the earliest ones. We know about that from the Bible, right? Uh, uh, Joseph takes Mary to uh, his uh, hometown to be counted. Uh, in the Roman census. So here's a, some quick examples, just so you know what they look like. Um, they're very detailed documents. Here's a census record from 1940. You can see all the columns, the name of the people on the left, and then it describes their uh, relationship to the house. Gives all kinds of interesting information, their gender, um, what their uh, race, was. Uh, typically, you'll see uh, that tends to vary. Uh, in U.S. Uh, census records, it tended to be white, black, or mulatto. That's it. That was all they had for, to be listed. So you'll see that they had to kind of mess with that a little. And it'll give uh, different information. We'll go through that. And it tells uh, the type of job they had. Sometimes it tells the value of their home, 
or their land. So these are very interesting documents. There's a census record from 1850. There's a U.S. census census record from 1790. That's the first year the United States started to have census. You could see they're handwritten, and they only listed uh, the head of household. Native Americans were not listed on that census, so you would think they didn't exist, but they did. They just weren't put into these documents. So it's important to know what's in them, but also what's not in them. This is a carving of, of a census being taken in Roman times. I, th I love this image. Uh, it shows just the men in line. They're being counted. They're being uh, written down. And in Roman times, uh, you had to go uh, to have uh, y yourself be counted every five years. And you had to go to your hometown. If you did not participate, uh, you could have your goods confiscated. Can you imagine that? Um, and then you'd, let, you'd go and give your name, and then you'd say uh, that you had a wife, you'd had some children and some slaves. Um, probably you didn't get the name of those people. And uh, if you want uh, slave free, you just had to name them and enter them in the census. So that's how they did it in Roman times. Now we're going to get personal. I want to talk about my family because um, I'm going to show how I did my genealogy using all kinds of records and information, but using census records. This is the Martinez family around 1981. There's my parents on the bottom and my two sisters, uh, Debbie and Maxine. And that's me up on top on the left. And that guy sleeping is my brother, Lorenzo. And there's my sister, Doris. Um, let's go back in time. There we are in 1970. That droopy guy in the bottom is me. I'm about six years old there. There's my sister Doris on the bottom. And then my parents, my father Roberto, my mom Ramona, and then my sisters uh, Maxine and Debbie and my brother Lorenzo up on top. Um, here's more family pictures uh, because the faces as much as I can because we're gonna get to the census records and you'll be seeing these folks. I love this photo. This is Mora. Agua Negra, New Mexico, in 1951. There are four generations of my family in this photo. That's my father, Roberto, holding my sister, Maxine. This is probably her baptism. Um, she's an infant. Uh, so there's Maxine and my father, Roberto. And then in front of my dad, sitting down, are his parents, Massimiano Martinez and Rosa Lovato. Behind them is Rosa's father, Encarnacion Lovato. And then that's my mom, Ramona Salazar, standing next to him. So four generations right there. There's my mom and dad in 1951, the year they were married. And by the way, um, we're going to look at census records. Uh, we can only look at 1940 back. Uh, of, pretty soon we'll be able to look at 1950. They wait a few Look, because of uh, personal and private information in census records. Audio and the. Uh, so. I'm sorry. Can everybody turn their mute on? All right. And this is my father, Roberto Martinez. Um, he uh, joined the Air Force around 1948. So this is him is in the Air Force in 1949. And there's his parents in the late 70s, Massimiano Martinez and Rosa Lovato, um, his parents and my grandparents. So here's a marriage in Mora, 1925. Uh, number six is that couple, Massimiano Martinez and Rosita Lovato. Um, it shows his parents, Eliseo Martinez and Henaria Romero. And then if you move to the right, it shows her parents, Encarnacion Lovato. We just saw him. Lovato, she was Salazar. And then the um, padrinos are um, Jose Gandert and Domilia Gandert. And there's their wedding photo, Mora, New Mexico, 1925. The padrinos are the Ganderts, and there's my grandpa Massimiano and my grandma Rosa Lovato. This is important. This is Massimiano's father, Eliseo Martin. Uh, there's a reason I have that name. You'll see later on in the presentation, but that's 
Eliseo Martin uh, Massimiano's father. Um, real quick, when I first started doing genealogy when I was about 15, uh, two things happened. I went to the genealogy library in Albuquerque. I put a uh, um, some microfilm up and I tried to read some old documents and I couldn't read them. The handwriting was too difficult. So I promptly gave up <laughs> looking at those documents. And then my grandpa Massimiano, who was alive at the time around 1978, he got mad. Uh, he got mad because he heard I was looking into the family history and he said, ¿Qué está buscando? What's he looking for? Well, the story goes that this guy, Eliseo Martin, was born out of wedlock. Now, that's not a big deal now, um, but back then people were uh, quiet about those things. So he didn't want me looking. So I stopped looking into the family history for a while. Uh, later on, I started asking questions. I asked my dad. He said that uh, Eliseo was raised by Roque Martinez and Refugio Martinez. But my father always told me something, and this is important when we look at the census records. He said, but Eliseo was born over the mountains in Taos to a woman named Rafaelita Martinez. Rafaelita Martinez. So remember that. So here we go. Here's the nine. It's a small image, and then I blew it up. There's uh, my dad's family. My grandpa Massimiano Martinez is listed. He's the head of the family. He's 42 years old, and his wife is Rosa. There's my father. He's um, 10 years old, Roberto, and there's my aunts and uncles, Flosella, uh, Eliseo, there's my uncle Lise, he was named after Massimiano's father, Eliseo, and our aunt Shaya, Elisaida. Look at all those W's. The census takers didn't know what to do with us because it said white, black, or mulatto on these documents, so we were always put down as white. There wasn't a designation uh, like Patricia was telling us earlier uh, for Latino or of Spanish origin or uh, uh, Mexican American or Chicano, Latino, none of that. So we were put down as white, which kind of erased our identity, at least in these documents, a wrong impression of who and what we were and are. But that, I want you to just keep that in mind when we're looking at these records. It shows that everyone in this family on the right is from New Mexico. This is 10 years earlier, the 1930 Mora census. Again, here's a, a blow up of the image there. There's my grandpa Massimiano Martinez and my grandma Rosa. And there's my father. He's the only kid they have at this point. He's not even a year old. But here's some information. It shows that Massimiano is 33. Rosa was 23. It's, to the right of that, you see it says 27 and 19. They ask, what age were you when you got married? So each census record every decade um, shows us a little bit different information. And it helps us uh, narrow down dates. The dates could be a little bit off because people didn't always know how old they were. But that gives us an idea when they were married and uh, how old they were. It, in that year. This is the 1920 Mora census. Um, this is interesting because I, I couldn't get this one blown up, but this has uh, my grandpa's older brother, Demesio Martinez, pretty much ran the family. Um, if you look at the top document on the far left, if you can read that, it says Demesio Martinez, he's the head of that house, he's 31 with his wife, Beatriz, and two kids. Then right underneath, the last entry is Henaria Romero. That's the Mestio and Massimiano's mom. But she's the head of her household. She's 56, and it says widowed. So right there, I know Eliseo, uh, the older guy, is already passed away by 1920. And then the next page, there's Massimiano, my grandpa. He's 23, living at uh, Henaria's house. Obviously, he doesn't get years. There's his sister, Delfinia, my tia Delfinia, who I knew when I was a kid, his brother, Demostenes, and there's tia Aurora. I knew her as an older lady with frizzy hair and big bright eyes, but she's 12 years old in this document. I, I love this. The reason I showed all those photos is I want you all to, when you're doing this kind of work, to try to put a human face uh, on these names because these can be kind of clinical. 
but these are human beings. These are our relatives, our ancestors. And she was a 12 year old girl. I don't know if she loved living in Mora or if she hated it, if she was traumatized, but she was a little girl in 1920. Oh, there it is. I did have it blown up. There's the Messio Martinez at, on top with his family. There's Genaria Romero. And then on the next page, there's Massimiano with his siblings. And again, there's their, their gender. Uh, they're all listed as white, WWW all the way down. And there's their age. Um, it has all kinds of information, whether they can read or write. Um, it sometimes asks if they're in school or if they've ever had any schooling. 1910. Okay. Um, here, this is the image blown up. There's the Messio Martinez. He's 23. There's the mom, Henaria. She's 42. Eliseos passed away by 1910. This document tells me that. There's my grandpa Massimiano. He's 14. Delfinia's eight. Demosthenes is seven. And Aurora's five. Um, later, I found a uh, an obituary in the Taos newspaper for Eliseo. He had passed away the year before in 1909. This is 1900, Mora census. There we go, there's Eliseo. He's still alive. It's Eliseo Martinez, he's the head. Um, there's Henaria. A daughter named Josefina. There's Demesio. And Look at this, Rafaelita. There's the name of uh, the woman my father said uh, had given birth. Well, Eliseo clearly is likely naming this daughter after his mother. And at the bottom is my grandpa Massimiano. What's great about this document, which was very helpful, if you look where it says after they're, they're white and it lists uh, their uh, gender, it gives generally a detailed uh, birth date for them. So for Eliseo, it says February 1859. So he's 41. Um, Henaria, April 1866. I've done her genealogy. She's from Peñasco and on down. And on the right, you see 15 uh, next to Eliseo and Henaria. That means they were uh, married 15 years in 1900. That helped because then I could go back to Mora and look Sure enough, it said, Eliseo Martinez, hijo adoptivo de Roque Martinez y Refugio Martinez. He was an adopted uh, child. Now, they didn't go through adopt adoption agencies or anything back then. Very typical in northern New Mexico for a family to give a baby to another family to raise. It might sound kind of strange. Well, we do things like that nowadays just for different reasons. But um, th they would give the baby. So... I started piecing this all together uh, that Eliseo was definitely not this, uh, uh, was not born of Roque and Refugio. And I worried, I, I thought I'll probably never find his parents and I'll just have to be uh, satisfied with what I get. So I knew that he was uh, uh, the son of Rafaelita. Um, 1880, well, where's 1890? Well, things happened to his, that's what census records are. And the story is that the 1890 census uh, were lost to a fire, damage, something like that. So we do not have uh, 1890 census records for New Mexico. But this is an 1880 Mora census record. And there you go. There's Refugio Martinez. Um, she's 54. And living with her is uh, listed as a son, Eliseo. 22 years old, he's a laborer. Um, the, the kind of work they do changes. My grandpa is listed as a laborer, I think in 1940, and then in 1930 as a freight worker, and then in 1920 as a farmer. So that was the Depression era, so they were doing a lot of different kinds of work. Um, so there's Eliseo, 22 years old, 1880 in Mora. Five years later, later he will marry uh, Henaria Romero. Now here's 1870, shows us uh, Eliseo listed as nine. They weren't sure how old he was, but he's listed living with Roque Martin and Refugio, Refugio Martin. I, I want you to pay attention to that because that just shows how the, the Martinez name uh, ebbs and flows and moves back and forth. Um, 
you'll see us says Martin Martinez. And in this 1870 record, the family name is Martin. So check this out. I was doing work a couple years ago for someone else researching their family in Taos. And I'm going down the baptismal records and this catches my eye. Look at the margin on the left-hand side, Eliseo Martin. So I looked at the date, March 17 of 1859. That caught my attention because my guy said he was born around February of 1859. This baptismal record is the following month. So I look in this record. It says that uh, he was baptized at Taos, um, four days old. The name he's given is Eliseo, and he's listed as the hijo natural. That means I'm born out of wedlock of Rafaela Martin. That's my guy. Rafaela Martin has a son in 1859, out of wedlock, named uh, in 1859. And it says, Residente del Ranchito de la Immaculada Concepcion. I thought that was ironic from the town of the Immaculate Conception. So this is my great-grandfather's baptismal record. Well, I called my good friend, uh, Patricia Sanchez Rao, and we, I told her I was excited, and I said, maybe we could find out more. So we started looking uh, at uh, records in Taos in the 1850s to see if we could find out more about Rafaela. Well, sure enough, a baby named Maria Andrea, uh, she's another natural child of Rafaela uh, Martinez. So she's called Martinez in this document. What's great about this document is it lists her parents, her, the, the abuelos, the grandparents. It lists Rafael's grandparents, Juan Martinez and Maria Dolores Garcia. It's right there. And uh, from the same town, uh, La uh, Pura y Limpia Concepcion. Um, so there's a daughter, Maria Andrea. Next, look at this. Uh, March of 1856, there's a baby, El Fego de Jesus Martin uh, Martinez, uh, baptized Hijo Natural de Maria Rafaela Martinez. She's, again, a vecina of the same plaza. So here we go. It's the 1850s, and my uh, great great grand uh, Rafaela Martin Martinez is uh, having babies out of wedlock. I'd love to know her story. Um, we don't know who the father or fathers were, but uh, clearly um, uh, she was living life, living her life. But I still wanted to know more, so we kept digging. Um, so I, I looked at the 1860 town census, census to see if I could find anything about her. And it's interesting. If you look at this record, on the top, at the bottom of the page, it says, Rafaela Martinez, there she is. And then it lists kids with the last name Sanchez, Eugenio. Uh, next page, Jose Sanchez, Jose Maria Sanchez. But look. There's Andrea Sanchez, El Fego Sanchez, Elisa, that's Eliseo, but he's listed as a little girl. They made a mistake. I would never have found him if not for the census and for these truths. So there is another clue, but why the Sanchez name? We know that the, the, the bottom three kids, we don't know who the dad is, but she, Rafaela, sticks that name on them for the 1860 census. Well, look at this 1850 census. Clearly in 1850, she had not had those out of wedlock children yet. But there she is, Maria Rafaela Martin, with some of her kids. Uh, Jose Eugenio, there's another one, Emiliana, uh, Maria Cristina, Jose de Jesus, and Jose Maria. They all have that Sanchez name. Um, interesting, I have a purple mark there because if you look, it says, where they're from. Well, all these kids were born in Taos County, but she is from Rio Arriba County. And we'll see that that makes sense uh, later when I do her genealogy. So here we go. She was, she was married. Here's the marriage record in Taos, 1839, Rafaela Martin, uh, Martinez. She married Santiago Sanchez. Um, and it lists her parents as Juan Martinez and Maria Dolores Garcia. So th there's that mystery solved. 
Uh, that's why those kids had the Sanchez last name. I went and looked at the burial records for Taos, and sure enough, in early 1850, Santiago Sanchez passed away. So she had roughly four or five children with Santiago, and then after he passed away, she had, at least that I'm aware of, three out of wedlock children, one of which was my uh, great grandpa, Eliseo Martin, who's baptized Martin. So now we're going to get into church records. Um, I started looking around. I couldn't find these folks in Taos. And look, these people traveled. Um, they were uh, married in Santa Clara, New Mexico, 1801. There on the margin, you see Juan Bautista con Maria Dolores. They're designated as Españoles. This doesn't mean they're from Spain or that they're of only Spanish ancestry there. Uh, they're likely, we'll see, of Spanish and Native American ancestry. They were just given the the highest title in the casta system, the caste system. And they're called vecinos, residents. And from this document, in the middle, it says Juan Bautista Martin, hijo legitimo, legitimate son, the Santiago Martin y de María Antonia Vallejo. So that gives me his parents, Santiago Martin and María Antonia Vallejo. And then the mom, María Dolores García, was the daughter of Esteban Garcia and Maria Viviana Sanchez. And in the document it says that los, todos vecinos, los primeros de Abiquiu. So Santiago and Maria Antonia were from Abiquiu and the others, uh, Esteban and Maria Viviana were from Santa Clara. So that tells me I need to look earlier in Abiquiu to find Santiago Martin and Maria Antonia Vallejos. Well, here's a census record again. This is a Spanish period, Abiquiu in 1790. Look at that page and think back to the American one. They're all handwritten. And this is the little plaza. There are all these little placitas in, around Abiquiu and what's today Española and Alcalde, Hernández, all these places. This is the Plaza de San Miguel in the Abiquiu jurisdiction. And it's a two column uh, page uh, numbered one through three. Uh, 13 on the left, and then in the middle, uh, uh, looks like 14 to uh, 27. Well, this is where I found my uh, ancestor, and my good friend Henrietta Martinez uh, Christmas got me this image. And here's a detail. There is uh, number three, Senor Don, he was a very important man, apparently, <laughs> Senor Don Santiago Martin. Español de 50 años. He's uh, Santiago Martín. He's considered Spanish. He's 50 years old. Casado con uh, Antonia Vallejos. Married to Antonia Vallejos. She's 42 years old. And it lists kids, hijos. It lists their ages. Uh, and then it lists um, hijas, at least sons. And then hijas, daughters, 14 and 10. But what's interesting, if you look, it's, it's a little hard to read. It says, sirvientes, servants, dos, two. De doce y ocho. Uh, one is 12 years old and one is eight. India e Indio. They have uh, two servants, a 12-year-old Indian girl and an eight-year-old Indian boy. These are Genisaro Indians. Um, these are part of, the, part of our family and they are part of us. I, I find this record very interesting. Um, by accident, I looked at the page, I was looking at all the names, and I found my mom's ancestor. Uh, number 15 is Miguel Lucero, considered Espanol, married, casado con Josefa Espinosa. Interesting, her father is uh, an Indian of Genicero, Juan Espinosa, and mother is Rosalia Saez, uh, Española. And they have, uh, she's 20, and they have kids that are uh, eight, five, uh, two and three and one, something like that. I can't see the whole screen because of all this amazing technology we have here. Are you all with me still? So this is a baptism at San Juan, New Mexico in 1774. There's Juan Bautista. Juan Bautista is the grand my great grandfather. This is his baptismal record in Rio Arriba. And it shows him, it says Juan Bautista, Bautista with the V, because there's no standardized spelling back there. It even says Bautice, Bautice, I baptized. And he's the hijo legitimo, legitimate son of Santiago Martin. 
y de Antonia Vallejos. So there's that family right there. So from here, I started looking around for marriage record for Santiago Martin and Antonia Vallejos. I couldn't find them anywhere in the north. When you can't find them in the obvious place, you start <laughs> stretching out, spreading out until you bump into them. Well, um, the parents of Maria Dolores Garcia, I found, look at this, in Isleta, south of Albuquerque in 1778. It's a beautiful hand. Uh, it says on the side, Esteban Garcia convivia vecinos parroquianos. They're, they're uh, parishioners and residents. Um, in the record, it says that his name was uh, Esteban Garcia Noriega, probably belonged to the Garcia Noriega family of Albuquerque. Uh, Luis uh, Garcia de Noriega was the main guy in Albuquerque in the mid 1700s. So maybe he belongs to that family. And Viviana Sanchez, I don't know for sure who their parents are, but that will take more research. And look at that, there's the marriage in Albuquerque in 1756, Santiago Martin con Antonia Vallejo. So this gets us back to the 1750s from Mora in 1940, uh, we're in Albuquerque in 1756. So what family does Santiago belong to? Um, New Mexico State Library was very helpful in helping me get this image of a will from the Spanish archives of New Mexico. This is the will of Pedro Martin Serrano. This is from 1768. Look at that beautiful uh, paper and ink, uh, calligraphy handwriting. Um, let's get a close up. Um, this shows on the right, uh, the, the opening uh, page. Uh, it just says, it's a formula in the name of uh, God, all powerful, uh, amen. And it says that I, uh, Pedro Martin Serrano, am a resident of this Puesta uh, de San Antonio del Corral de Piedra, and that he is the hijo legitimo, the legitimate son of Blas Martin Serrano y Maria de Vargas, ya difunta. She's deceased is what ya difunta means. So here we go. We're back another generation. Um, this Pedro, he's... Uh, 1768. He's probably born around 1700 or 1710. And his father is Blas Martin Serrano. It's interesting. He says that he um, had an accident. Um, he's sick and uh, he gives himself to God. He actually has to be buried in, in the church of Santa Clara in the door, underneath the doorway. That, that's fascinating. But look at this over here on the left. I love this uh, part of the will. Uh, Bear with me. It says, Declaro haber sido casado. I declare that I was married con Doña Margarita de Luna, with Doña Margarita de Luna, viuda, she's a, she was the widow of Esteban Duran. So she was married before. But then he says, Según el orden de nuestra Santa Madre Iglesia, according to the order of our Holy Mother Church, de cuyo matrimonio tuvimos y procreamos, from which marriage had and procreated 15 hijos, 15 children. And they're listed here. The first is Gregorio. Look at the second, Santiago. This is our guy, Santiago. It goes on, it lists Gertrudez, Diego, Domingo, Pedro, Isabel, Difunta, Ted, Juan, Felipe, Maria Rosa de los Reyes. Uh, she's Difunta, dead, pobrecita. Maria Josefa, Difunta, Juana, Difunta, Francisca, Maria Rosa, Josef, Maria Ventura. And then at the end, he says, los, de, los que declaro por mis legítimos hijos y herederos, who I declare for my uh, legitimate children and heirs. Pretty cool, huh? So here we go. From Blas Martin Serrano, Pedro's father, um, we know that he was the son of Domingo Martin Serrano and Josefa de Herrera. Domingo was the son of Luis Martin Serrano. This is all in the 1600s now. And Luis was the son of Hernan Martin Serrano II and a local Indian woman. So he was mestizo, Luis. And uh, Hernan II, he was the guy who came with Juan de Oñate in 1598. He was the sargento of the expedition. 
He was from Zacatecas, Mexico, and he was the son of Hernan Martin Serrano I, and an unknown mother. We don't know much about that first Hernan Martin Serrano. Um, he may have been from Spain. He may have been born in the Valley of Mexico in the 1830s. And who uh, Hernan II's mom was, she might have been a, a Spanish woman. She might have been a mestiza, half Spanish, half Indian woman. She might have been a, an Indian woman. We don't know. We may never know. But this uh, is 12 generations put together with census records, church records, and civil documents. So to bring a in 1966 in Albuquerque. I'm the little guy. That's my dad. Look at that. All these generations of Martin Serrano, Martin, Martinez, uh, Spanish ancestors, um, Native American ancestors, Mexican ancestors. And there we are in 1994. That's me and my father Roberto playing mus musica with his group, Los Reyes Albuquerque. There we are in our blue trajes. So that's it, folks. The 2020 census is here. Be counted. Your descendants are counting on you. Thank you. We'll add some clapping there. But if anybody <laughs> has any uh, questions or comments, uh, now would be the time. You can just unmute yourself, or you can ask a question in the chat box, and I. I just wanted to make a quick comment. This is um, Stephanie. I am the staff reporter here at the college. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. It was very informative. I recently um, did explore some of my own ancestry and figured out that I am a daughter of the American Revolution um, based on what I found from my ancestry and a lot of people with census records and a lot of people don't know that many New Mexicans have a connection to the Revolutionary War because of the Presidio, which was the Spanish, um, the Spanish army that actually provided some key funding to the Revolutionary Army that was decisive in winning the war. So you might have some unexpected things in your history. And I was wondering if you had come across anything unexpected like that when you're doing your genealogical research. Well, yeah, that's the thing about doing genealogy. It's important and you have to be brave to do it because you're going to find out all kinds of things. Those uh, what happened around 1780 is that the, the Spanish government uh, pretty much imposed a tax on people to raise funds for the American revolutionaries. And th that tax was paid here in New Mexico uh, by the vecinos, the, the people who were designated as españoles or mestizos. Uh, they would uh, pay the head of household, the, the man would pay two pesos. And uh, uh, in the Native American, the Pueblo communities, uh, the men would pay one peso. And this was done in New Mexico, and it was also done throughout Mexico, too. So uh, they're also patriots as well. Uh, they, they did the exact same thing down south. Uh, uh, it's not likely that our ancestors who did that might, I have an ancestor, Tomas Roybal, who was a soldier of the Presidio in that time period. He's one of those. Uh, it's not likely that they even knew what they were giving money. The King of Spain, they probably didn't want to give uh, the colonials in places like New Mexico and Mexico any ideas. But that is part of our story. That's part of our history. And, you know, um, I'm trying to think of uh, one of the most uh, surprising things. I think what I find most surprising, uh, what I have found in my genealogy, on my mom's side, what I found fascinating, fascinating is my mom has a Lucero line that I've traced back from um, uh, Sapeo, New Mexico, down through San Miguel del Vado. And as I did the research about five or six generations back, um, it got to uh, uh, a guy named um, Juan Lucero, who had married a, a young lady by the name of Estefania Martin. So, this Martin family is everywhere. Everyone has them in their family. I mean, we have a lot of common ancestors, the Montoyas, the Chavez, the all come from those families and other families as well. But I found out that Estefania Martin uh, was the little sister of Antonio Jose Martin, the famous priest, <coughs> priest of Taos. <coughs> Excuse me. So that, that was surprising. 
Thank you. <clears throat> I, ha I have one, uh, Rob, this is Rick. Um, yes. So, and the presentation was fantastic. So thank you for that. Um, thank you. Can you, so I noticed when you did the 1920 um, um, screenshot from, from Mora, it actually, and I could have, I could have been reading it wrong, but it actually said, you know, where, where did they actually do the census? Like, where did they actually go to, 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 to be counted? Yeah. And it says uh, the precinct or whatever says El Rito, which and, and, and where the college got its start. Um, did, do you, and this might be an unfair question because it, it's tangential in some ways, but when you go back a hundred years, yeah. Or more, did people generally have to travel a, a good way to, to be, you know, it's obviously they weren't doing, they weren't getting this in the mail necessarily, or, or, you know, certainly weren't doing it online. How, how did that, what was that process like when the, when the um, census came around? In the Roman, in the Roman times, you had to go to your hometown. So if you were born in Los Angeles, if we did that, if you were born in Los Angeles and you lived in New York City or Paris, you had to travel back oh, wow. to Los Angeles <laughs> to be wow. counted in the census. But not so in these situations, all indications are that the census taker went to the community. Okay. Um, throughout New Mexico. There's a lot of San Antonio's. Right. El Rito was uh, what we now call Chacon in the Mora Valley. And Agua Negra is what we now call Holman. Um, and Cleveland, that little town in the Mora Valley was San Antonio. Mora used to be called uh, San Antonio Lo de Mora. Um, these names changed in the 1880s or so when the railroad started to go through and the, and, or the um, post office started to establish uh, them, uh, post offices everywhere. They usually grabbed the local postmaster and a lot of times they had an Anglo name or a European, Northern European name and they would change it to that person's name. Mm. So the El Rito in uh, uh, Mora isn't the same one uh, that you're talking about, but it was a right. common name. That they, it just means the little, they're just little plazas. People would establish themselves and they were placitas. But another, you made me think of something else, and I don't know if I can, I, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for it. Uh, I don't know if I'll find it, but you know, one of the more sad things you see on these uh, records, um, this one right here from 1910. If you look at Henaria, that's my great grandmother. You go all the way to the right, you see a seven and a four. A lot of times they would ask, how many children have you given birth to and how many are living? Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, you see, you, and tip, I mean, rarely you'll see four and four. Typically it'll be 10, six, mm -hmm. 12, eight, nine, four. It, it was very common uh, for uh, children to uh, pass away early or if, or if an, well, uh, a parent or a, a, a smallpox or something would come through. Um, so you see this as a, a very common indicator, but it also shows you like uh, um, where the names come from. I also forgot to mention that. It's interesting, um, Eliseo named his daughter Rafaelita Rafaela is his mom's name. And you see the names get passed down from generation to generation. Oh, that's fantastic. Thank you. We have time for one more question if anybody wants to take advantage of that. Well, I'll ask one um, to, to finish us off. And you really did uh, end with this last slide, uh, but we are really trying to generate interest in people getting involved in the census. Unfortunately, only about 30% uh, of households in Rio Riva County have filled out their census for 2020. Uh, what would, how can you help us appeal to our audience uh, to get them interested in filling out the census? Well, all I can say is that Participating in the census is like participating in voting. It's part of 
what we need to do. We need to participate in our government. We need to participate in our community. Um, it's not just for the government in Washington, D.C. that we do this. We do it for our local government, for our state. We get funding uh, the more people we have. And if we're not counting certain people, then we're going to get less money. Um, it's also helpful for communities, uh, places like Mora, places like Tierra Maria, Chama, Costilla. These are little pueblitos, little towns, and the pueblos too. You have Oque Awinge, uh, Santa Clara, all these uh, communities up there. We want them to uh, not just survive, we want them to thrive and uh, have uh, beautiful places uh, for the people who are living there and for their children and grandchildren. So it's really crucial for people to participate in the census. It's easy. I did it online. If you can't get it online, I bet you can have a form mailed to you or is there somewhere where they can pick one up because um, they don't need to go anywhere. They just need to fill it out or go online. I, I did it online and I got counted. So yeah, uh, actually, uh, after we give you a virtual round of applause, <laughs> uh, thank you so much for visiting us here at Northern New Mexico College. Thank you. Uh, Rob, but we're gonna um, actually play everybody out uh, with a PSA that was just created featuring uh, students from across Northern New Mexico. Because one of the things about Northern New Mexico is we're uh, counted and hardest to count areas. Uh, but in our region, um, uh, one of the biggest groups that is undercounted are children of color. So please remember that when you're counting members of your household, it's not just the adults, it's everybody living in the household as of April 2020. Um, and we really do want to bring this funding in because I think a lot of us have these visions of improved schools, new schools, beautiful schools, and um, all of the beautiful descendants, our children and their descendants that will fill them. So thank you everybody for participating. Rob, if I can get you to end screen share so I can share my screen. You got it. Yeah, thank you so much. And thank you for joining us. Thank you. And I had it set up. Of course, when we were sharing new links. <laughs> okay, here we go. I'm Jonathan Sanchez. I'm 14 and from Velarde, New Mexico. The 2020 census campaign to get New Mexico counted is currently ongoing and is one of the most important things we can do as citizens. My name is Lucas, my age is 11. What the census means to me is more funding for our first responders, which are our police and firefighters. We have until September 30th, 2020 to complete your census. Hola, mi nombre es Maria Chavez. Tengo 13 años y el censo está importante porque me ayuda al SNAP program. Hi, my name is Max, I'm 14, and it's important to take the census because it provides grants for substance abuse programs. To complete your 2020 census, respond and mail back the census packet mailed to your household, or go to 2020census.gov, or call 844-330-2020. Hi, I'm Kunji, help me! Hola, mi nombre es Sofia. My name is Beta. I am Landon. My name is Des. Count me. Cuéntame. Count me. Count me. Cuéntame. Count me. Count me. Count me. Count me. Mi nombre es Diana. En su nombre es Miguel. Cuéntame. So again, thank you all for joining us. Have a good night. And remember to do the census. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Have a great night.